family lived in, in the most onerous and frightening conditions in Budapest uh, when the Nazis were controlling that city. And, and one day, uh, Judith and her father and her sister uh, went out for a walk. They had been confined to a, a Jewish ghetto in a Jewish apartment building, and they just needed some fresh air. And they uh, didn't expect anything bad to happen. However, they encountered uh, Gestapo agents, and they immediately took off uh, Judith's father to jail. And from jail, he was taken to a, a Nazi labor camp where he was forced to build anti-tank trenches. Judy did a m wonderful thing in terms of getting her father released from that uh, labor camp. And I, I think you would like to hear the story directly from Judy. It's an incredible story. Well, you know, when, when those things happened to us, Eva and I went to the Jewish community center and we, we stayed there because unless, you know, if we, if we didn't, they would have deported us and put us in as, uh, you know, we would have had to work as prostitutes for the Nazis. And we wanted to avoid that. So Eva had a friend who recommended us to go to the, to the community center and we went there and there we met a lovely girl whose uncle had been working at the Swiss legation. And he helped get my father a, a legitimate pass. And my mother sent a mailman over there to the camp where daddy was working and he got out and he came back to the Swiss house to which we all went at about that same time. And he was in terrible shape. It was just a mess. He, poor dear, he was completely, he felt awful. He was just, you know, like a wreck. Luckily, we managed to survive this and around December of 44, because the Nazis wanted to have, you know, uh, the area around the, the Danube River near the Margaret Island, the people that we were staying with who had a Swiss, in a Swiss protected building, the whole building was emptied. We were all taken to the ghetto and we were there until about the 15th of January when the, when the Russians liberated us. And then we went back to our old apartment. Of course, our, our building was a mess, but, and we lived in the cellar for a while. And of course, the Russians took, the, I, had a, I had a high post sewing machine in the maid's room in our apartment, and the Russians took it down to the cellar and used it to mend their boots. And we were down in the cellar until we had a chance to go back upstairs, which took, which took a couple of months. And then we were upstairs and we started to live halfway normally, which was pretty good. And my father had a vineyard in near Budapest, you know, about, I don't know, maybe a hundred miles away. And uh, the fellow that, uh, that was taking care of the vineyard used to bring us food whatever he could find in their area. And they brought us some, you know, vegetables and things like that. And of course, we got very lucky because once I met Gus, he used to bring us turkey meat and bananas <laughs> and oranges, and we really had fun. It was nice. Uh, what, one of the things uh, Judy didn't mention, which, which is very interesting, is the Swiss pass that her friend's uncle issued that got Judy's father out of the labor camp, uh, one of Judy's neighbors uh, saw that it had been typed on an Olympia typewriter and was able to write after Judy's father's name and family using the same typewriter, in effect conferring diplomatic immunity on Judy's entire family, which, would, which saved them from deportation to a labor or a concentration camp. Um, wh why don't you tell us how you and Gus uh, met on the streets of Budapest? Well, you know, <laughs> I had a girlfriend who wanted to, who wanted to rent their major, their big dining room, their big, or big living room to somebody. 
an American, and so she and I went to the corner of uh, the end of our street where all the GIs were, all the enlisted men, and Gus was standing in front, and this, this girlfriend of mine was not shy, so she started talking to everybody, and she started talking to Gus and everybody else, and there was a Hungarian American who spoke to her in Hungarian, and she told him that, that uh, she wanted to rent his room, and they did rent it to two women from delegation, which was very nice for them. And I went there because she wasn't sure that her English was good enough, and I had lived in London, so I helped her with the English. But it didn't take too long. She met everybody, all the, all the enlisted men, and she was hanging around with them. And I started going out with Gus, and we went around the city, and we went up to the royal palace, and walked down, and you know, from the palace to the, to the area down there, which was an area that was, was sort of called the Toban, which was sort of a very nice area, you know. But we went down through all the rubble, and after we went down, people said, well, gee, you shouldn't have walked that way. It's full of bombs and all kinds of things that you would get hurt. But we didn't think about those things, and thank God we didn't have any trouble. So we marched around, and we went to whatever museums reopened. And I remember I took us to several artists. One of them told him that, that being an artist is a terrible life. It's very, very difficult. And he was a famous Hungarian painter. But he said it's, very, it's a very tough life. But poor dear. He wanted to do it, and there he is. He's doing it today, too. And, 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 and the Libras came here on what was called a bride ship, which was a ship that transported uh, American GIs and their European brides to the United States. Judy was sick the entire time coming over here, and has decided never to ever go on a boat again. Uh, the, the Libras then settled in the Bronx in a very poor uh, Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, and uh, Judy got a job working for a company. Uh, one of uh, Augustus' relatives got Judy a job working in a company where Judy had to operate an electric sewing machine, which she had never operated before, so they fired her. <laughs> and, and, and then she got a job at, at a company called Garay, which was a handbag company. And, and why don't you tell us about your experience working well, at Garay? Well, at Garay, you know, I, I mean, it was very interesting. See, one frame, I used to frame the top of the bag the front and the back, and another frame I would do the legs of the, of, the, of the gussets, you know, so it was a divided work. And I wanted very much, you know, they, they, I, there was a sewing machine operator there whom I got very friendly with, and she said to me, Judy, you don't belong in this place. Why don't you go to the handbag, handbag workers' union and speak to Mr. Lublina, who is the president, and tell him that you can do all these things beautifully, and he should send you to somewhere where you could really work and do nice work. So I went to see Mr. Lublina, and he said to me, I don't think you are able to do all this, but I'll send you up to Nettie Rosenstein, see if you can do anything there. I was there for 14 years. <laughs> and in the beginning, I was an assistant worker, they had, a, they, had a, they had a pattern maker, designer, and then I, I, was, uh, I was his assistant, and he got sick, and then I got his job. And in the end, before they closed the factory, I even ran the factory. I did everything. And I used to take all the patterns home at night and do all the, you know, the dye work and, you know, prepare for for doing the, you know, for the samples. And it worked out very nicely. I was very lucky. It worked out very well. Ju Judy was the only woman in the United States who could construct a handbag from start to finish. It had all been made on an assembly line process, but because Judy had apprenticed 
at an old world handbag manufacturing company in Budapest, she learned all the necessary skills and could make a handbag from start to finish, which was one of the reasons that she rose so quickly and, and, and so highly at, at Nettie Rosenstein. And uh, by 1963, the Liebers had decided that it was time for uh, Judy to start her own company. And, and, and could you tell us how you started your own company and what well, that was we, like? Well, we rented a loft. It was only 280 square feet. And we had three workers, plus me and Gus. And then there used to be a very nice bookkeeper at Rosenstein who had retired. And she came and helped us with some of the bookkeeping for no fee at all, which was very nice. And then later we got a, a girl who, was the, who became the bookkeeper. And in the beginning, everybody helped pack up everything and send it, you know, and Gus used to go up to Saks and Bergdorf and Bonvi Teller and deliver the bags in the beginning. But as time went on, he didn't have to do that anymore. We had a shipping clerk and we had, we had a bigger factory. We had like 30, 40 workers. And then when we closed the business, I mean, when, when I sold the business, we had 200 people working for us, which was very nice. Hundreds of them were just making the beaded bags. How, how did you come to make the beaded bags? Well, the way I started, I got a, you know, I, I decided that it would be nice to make a metal bag that wasn't gold because the ladies wouldn't have to run to the bank and pick up the bag and then take it back to the bank when they were finished going out at night with it. So I made bags of brass that we gold and silver plated depending on what color the customers wanted. And when I started out, I, they sent me samples of the little box that I had designed, the first piece that I did. And it looked so terrible that I had to put rhinestones on, on the areas that were a mess. <laughs> Otherwise, I couldn't have sold it. And once I did, I started like that. In the end, I made fully beaded bags. That's where I started with that. So that's my favorite bag still, because it was the start of all of it, which was very nice. And, and, and in the course of, of, of Judy's career, she got to meet uh, a number of very famous women who became uh, quite friendly with her. And, and, and why don't you tell us about your relationship with Barbara Bush and how she visited the showroom yes, and took you to Barbara, the White House? Well, Barbara Bush, I made her the inaugural bag which was made from a fabric that I got from Skazi because it matched her dress. And she, she invited everybody who worked on her inaugural gown, whether it was the shoes, the dress, the bag, the jewelry, whatever. And we were all invited to, to, her, to, her, to the White House for a luncheon. And we became very good friends. And she came once to visit us at the factory. Naturally, they had to check everything. You know, they looked in every drawer, in every closet, in every cabinet to make sure that nothing was there that could be a problem. And then Mrs. Bush came. And she had a ph photographer with her. And all the workers, each one got a photograph that she had, she had sent them that they had, where well, she was standing with each one, and they photographed it, and we, and she sent them each a piece of it, which was very, very nice. She was a wonderful lady.